Welcome back, folks. Episode 39, Get a Grip on Lighting Podcast. On today's show, we have our old friend from the past, a blast from the past. We got Bill Hurd. He used to own Nova Lighting uh, down in the Carolinas, and then he was the president of Nailed. And then, you know, Greg and I met him and kind of sat at his feet when we started in this business and really listened to Bill, and he coached us and helped us, even though he was just a, really a competitor of ours, but not regionally, but, you know, he owned another lighting company. So, we really sought his advice and talked to him a lot, and we went through a lot of things on this podcast, didn't we, Greg? Yeah, I had a very nailed us type discussion, what we do at the conventions, bounce around all the hot topics, and had a good time, for sure. Yeah, so Bill, thanks for coming on the show. We really enjoyed it, and I think our listeners will as well. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Keystone Technologies. Go to K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H dot com. That's KeystoneTech.com. Hey, what's Matt going to throw up for the YouTube watchers out there? Well, today we're going to look at the LED high bay. That's something that they've really come on strong with. You know, they have a lot of retrofit products, but now they are getting a lot of light fixtures. And this is one of the better ones I've seen out there. They've really checked all the boxes that you need in an LED high bay. It's a compact design, has a 100,000 hour life, uh, about 135 lumens per watt, I think is where they're at. Comes automatically with a frosted lens to eliminate the glare. Zero to 10 volt dimming option, 480 volt. They cover everything. So I think it's a real good option. And the best part about it is you know where the drivers is and where how to get it and where to um, use it in the future. Keystone has it built for it. So great fixture, great option. Go to keystonetech.com. That's K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H.com, baby, keystonetech.com. And as we talked about earlier, every episode of this show on the Get a Grip on Lighting.com website is brought to you by the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. Go to NAILD.org org man come on son get down there join our association take some education but for now listen to this podcast with bill hurd get a grip on lighting welcome to the get a grip on lighting podcast bill hurd hey thanks michael greg good to see you guys you too bill hey i gotta jump into this because it's fresh on my mind and this is unrehearsed but do you see behind me you see that angled Matt. light right there no that angled I do. light i okay, do so I, I'm doing a lighting project at my office right now, changes out all the fixtures. And, you know, this is just goes to show you that all these lighting projects are never easy. They're never straightforward. I got two fixtures in my office and if I needed four lenses, they sent me three. So what happens when I don't have that lens is that's what it looks like. <laughs> a little, little hot spot, little hot spot going on. <laughs> you got to love lighting, man. It's always something different. And oh, it's I'm, incredible. I'm figuring this out. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. Are they, are they made in the USA, those fixtures, Greggy? Uh, the company is, whether they're actually made, I, I don't know. I don't know. Tumble. But the drivers aren't. That's drivers true. probably aren't. I don't even know what the driver is. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bill, the last, you know, we did about, uh, I don't know, six or ten episodes with Nailed Guys before we really, really launched hard. And we had to trash all of them because they were just a little too wild. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so let's be careful, we'll, we'll, eh? <laughs> yeah, we'll keep this. We'll keep this pretty easy. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. So, Bill, you know, you you own Nova Lighting. How long did you own Nova Lighting for before you sold it? Uh, f about fourteen years. Um, and fourteen years prior to that, I was with Philips. And so, I made the transition in two thousand to go from uh, Philips regional manager to my own gig. And and then four years ago, uh, a company in the Carolinas bought us, and then Border States subsequently bought them in two sixteen. So. I've had a few role changes here in the last couple of years, but still in lighting, mm. going on my 32nd year. Hmm. So uh, been a lot of changes, nothing like the last five years, but there's been a lot of changes. What's, what's, um, what's your role at Border States? So right now I am the uh, business development manager for the national accounts segment, which at this point is 99% lighting. So I'm uh, tasked to go out, develop relationships with the key vendors on the national account um, arena, uh, prospect for new accounts, and then turn them over to account managers to manage and then go out and dig, dig dishes again. So it's, um, you know, now we got a footprint of 21 locations and I mean, 21 states and 110 locations or, you know, $2 billion company. It's, uh, you know, the, 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 the playing field is a little bit different than, than I had at Nova Lighting where I concentrated strictly on the Carolinas, but I'm still doing the same thing for the most part, but on a bigger scale. Selling light bulbs every day. <laughs> I haven't heard the word light bulb in I don't know how long. I don't listen to this podcast enough then, Bill. Uh, very, good. <laughs> very good. 
So I, I'll what, never what, forget. It, yeah. No, I, you know, when I started in 86 with Phillips, I mean, CFLs were not even around. Oh, I mean, they were coming out in the late 80s and you guys were even born. That's <laughs> nice. That's a compliment. Yeah. Hey, man, I was born in 77. I don't have any of those millennial problems. Come on, man. That's so, true. Greg, That's true. That's true. Greg, you're going to jump yeah. in there, though. Yeah. So what made you made the move from uh, Philips to Nova Lighting? You were working for a manufacturer, then you decided you want to switch gears and be a distributor or buy into a distribution. What made you decide that? Well, you know, I, you know, being an entrepreneur, I mean, you guys can probably relate, is – that's where you truly actually feel more secure than any other position working for anybody else. Number one, number two, you can control your own destiny and, you know, working for a large conglomerate, nothing wrong with it. There's some security and, you know, benefits are a little different, but I was at the right age, 39. And I said, look, if I jump ship and, and I did walked into a situation that was pretty tough, um, coming out of foreclosure, but, yeah, I had 14 years behind me. I had a lot of a lot of people I knew, and uh, I said, "Look, if I'm 39. If I jump in, I fail. Yeah, you know, I'll be 40 years old. I'll jump back out and go to work for another vendor. You know, that day. Uh, so that kind of gave me the confidence to take the leap and walk over. And then at that point, we you know we grew the company fourfold in 14 years. And as Michael knows, you know we we did we basically did it from the cradle to the grave." You know, we weren't just a supply house. We got into facilitating labor. We understood EPACT. We did the design. We did the auditing and surveying. We kind of took it from, like I said, cradle to the grave, all the way to recycling and collected the incentive. And so we got involved in that stuff, um, the project in the mid, mid 2000s, which was ahead of the curve from a lot of folks, which differentiated ourselves. And so we would walk into facilities, large facilities that were being serviced MRO wise day to day by the big guys, the gray bars and the West Coast and the Grangers. And we'd walk in, do a half million dollar or a million dollar lighting project, walk out in three months. And the current supplier didn't have any idea what went on because they mm. weren't looking up. They were looking down and our world's looking up. Right. And mm. so it's a um, that's that 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 was uh, that's been exciting. And that's the main reason why I took the leap, because you know, I could do those things. We could do what we want uh, when we wanted to, and we weren't tied to a bureaucratic large organization selling one product, you mm -hmm. know, with a distributor like Nova. We were, I hate to say the word vendor agnostic and technology agnostic. And so our focus was selling with integrity, which is doing what's best for the client. If I wanted one brand on a wall or another brand in the ceiling or another brand on a pole, then I can do that. You know what's funny that a lot of the nail guys have that in common. Yep, exactly right. You That's probably what? why we're all doing doing what we're doing, right? Yeah, a lot of the nail guys, you know, you you hear that the same message from them that I need multiple brands. I'm not a dealership, I'm a distributor. I need yep. I need to be able to offer my customer the the solution that's right for them and not have it to be X, Y, or Z company. You know, it's another th another thing you said there which I thought was really interesting was that you know, a lot of people think that being an entrepreneur is risky and it is, but in, in another sense, it's actually less risky than being, being working for a company because you have no control over what, whether the company, you know, a new boss comes in, a new CEO comes in, he wants to ch clear house and he doesn't like the cut of your jib and you're out of work the next day. That's um, exactly right. You know, there's something in being an entrepreneur that I think people overestimate the risk and underestimate the upside of learning and challenging yourself, you know, and uh, that's you know, what a lot of us nail guys have in common. You're exactly right. And what, you know, one of my motivating factors back then, and I, I don't know how to say this gently, but in the electrical distribution world, I think it's filled with, for lack of a better word, it's filled with mediocrity overall. I don't want that to come across wrong, right? So mm -hmm. when I was with a major manufacturer calling on distribution, you know, I walked away saying, man, if they can do that that way and be successful and make that kind of money, what have you, then I felt like I'm confident that I could do it. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you just do things a little different and you raise the bar a little bit, then uh, you could differentiate yourself, which is the name of the game for us. We got to we got to find a way to differentiate ourselves in the marketplace to be different than the guys that maybe two billion, hundred billion, hundred million dollar companies. And we're small lighting guys that, um, you know, maybe hard to, to, to survive if we did the same thing. 
day to day. Everybody sells material, everybody sells lights, switch gear, what have you. But if you do it differently, which the model we put together at, at, at Nova, we did it differently. We, we took a customer, made it easy for him. He rang one neck. We could take him from the cradle to the grave and, um, you know, with, with less concerns. And so that's, that's the model we, we took and it worked. And that model still works today. A little differently working for a conglomerate like uh, Border States the model still works. You got to sell with integrity and you guys know in the market today that we live in. And I, I said this, I said this a month ago and, and you may agree or disagree with our biggest competitor today in the marketplace is not, you know, the, the players I just mentioned, the gray bars, the West Coast, the Regencies, the biggest competitor we have is a misinformed, uneducated customer base who doesn't hmm. know the questions to ask. They don't know what questions to ask. And so you've got every Tom, Dick and Harry today, that's jumping on the bandwagon of this low hanging fruit of the LED world. And they can say anything in front of a client because they don't know what questions to ask about, you know, what do you mean by that warranty or what, what's LPW mean or what, what, are you, what are you basing your life on, temperature rating or what have you. And, and so all the stories sound the same, but you're getting, you know, product X on one hand and product Y on the other. So it, it's to me, that's where the integrity comes into play. And, and, and what we're up against is a, an end user base that, not to their fault. They just don't know what questions to ask today. And they're being sold a bill of goods. And so we're now to the point where the first generation LEDs that went in, two things are happening. You know, one, they're, the, the, the wattage, the LPW is, lumens per watt is half today. So they may be ripe for a retrofit. And number two, the, the early adopters bought product that, you know, didn't, it's not working today. And they can't find parts for them because that company's no longer around. So that's, that's the biggest thing that I see is, is everybody's in the business and there's folks that just jumped on the bandwagon a couple of years ago and they don't understand the advantage i think we have and the players that nailed is we understand legacy technology and i think understanding legacy technology gives you an added edge in front of the client because you truly understand life life is on apples and apples with led and legacy lumens are not apples and apples designs on apples and apples so uh, you know, that, that to me is, is frustrating on one hand um, with the competition that we have. That's not selling the right way, in my opinion. But it, on the other hand, it's a good thing because we walk in behind them and, you know, we, we, we talk differently. And, you know, we talk, um, I, I keep using the word integrity, but it's, it's, that's what I've always tried to use is we sell not what's best for us, but what's best for the client, mm -hmm. the customer. Now, was Nova going kind of going back to that? Was Nova an electrical distributor too, or were they just lighting focused? One hundred percent lighting. Yeah, so, it, it, there was temptations over the years, but you know, we sold wire nuts. That's about the extent of our electrical equipment. But we were one hundred percent lighting. So, in two thousand and fourteen, you sold to an electrical distributor. I did. You they trader. Needed. You're a trader. <laughs> we, is that where you're going with that, Greg? No. I'm so, going there. No, no, not necessarily. I, I'm just curious no. on how an electrical distributor yeah. is interested in a lighting only distributor like Well, what, what's interesting is that over the, the years, I had a couple of large electrical distributors that were interested in, in, in Nova and myself. And the, the primary reason is because they were seeing this whole lighting world exploding. And a traditional electrical distributor don't understand lighting. They understand switch gear, they understand commodities, but they don't understand lighting and they don't know how to do it the right way. So, uh, the, the, you know, you only have, when you're a business owner, you only have one shot to say yes. You can say no multiple times, which, which I did. And the primary motivation in my nose were that it would eliminate some employees and, um, and I couldn't look myself in the mirror. This particular sale, the timing was right. Um, the, 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 the president of this particular company, Sheely, was a friend of mine. They were a quarter of a billion dollar company. They needed somebody Ooh. to, they needed somebody to run their lighting division, to manage the lighting and control world that was so fragmented and confusing, and whether it's managing agents, managing vendors. So my role was vetting vendors in this whole LED and control world, vetting the vendors that we want to sell, and then manage a group of lighting specialists out there. And, and, and putting a business plan in front of them to go after the end user and to control the end user, where historically this distributor um, allowed the agent to do that. The, the account manager for a typical distributor, when they have a lighting opportunity, immediately turns to the agent, 
who comes in, specifies what they want to specify. They do all the work. They control the relationship with the end user. Your margins are cut in half. So we saw margins go up 25%. Was this Border yeah, States our, or Nova? That's other no, Border States. When, sure. when, when Nova Lighting came over to Border States mm. and we, and we, and we focused on lighting a bit more. We controlled the end user and the process from the cradle to the grave a bit more. Our margins went up. So, trader, you know, I'm 57. Uh, we're just joking with 55. you. No, 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 no. It's okay. It's okay because I, I feel like I'm doing the same thing. Um, I'm still involved in the industry intimately. I'm still dealing with vendors. I'm still trying to vet this, this world we live in. But Border, I mean, Sheely Electrical, who bought me, um, sold to Border States, which is now a, you know, a, a, a global, not a global, but a, a United States company that is all over the place. So that's, so I, you know, they wanted to expand my role beyond just the Carolinas, which I was doing with, with Sheely and Nova, and get me in a role where I can be in front of customers nationally to take advantage of this, what's happening in lighting. You know, whether you have an industrial customer or a commercial customer, Let's help them out. So it, it's timing is everything, guys. You know that the, your day is going to come, and I'm going to put a phone call, and we're going to do a podcast, and we're going to talk about trading, <laughs> traders. <laughs> now, one question. Hopefully, this doesn't come across as offensive, but did Chile buy you, or did they buy your company? That is an interesting question because, oh. well, at the end of the day, okay, the, because I'm not. I, I, I we had a team, and I'll always go back to the team. Right. So, but at the end of the day, you know, they, they, they buy people. And, and so, um, if, if I wasn't in the picture, would they be as interested in Nova lighting? Probably not, not saying they wouldn't have acquired them, but you know, I, I controlled a lot of the, uh, the major customers out there as well as owning the company and, and being president. So, as you guys know, we do everything from marketing to hiring to firing to setting strategy and the whole bit. So I, I really don't want to answer that in a way that comes across arrogant. But, yep. you know, it, it is what it, when you're a small company, it is what it is. So, yep, I understand. Can I give you the answer it, that? Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's so they, they bought Bill Hurd. <laughs> so, Michael, if somebody you know. were to buy your company, if you weren't. If, I'm out. If, <laughs> I'm gone, bro. I, but I they have would, to be the would, boss. <laughs> they wouldn't buy you if um, if you weren't in the picture. Same with Greg. Well, so, what I'm doing right now, so I have three divisions. Kind of, a, I have a small company, right. but it has three separate areas. Okay. One is one is electrical contracting, one is lighting distribution, and one is uh, lamp recycling. And they each have unique brands, and so they serve different competitors to each other right. as well. And uh, though I've um, I've really worked towards exiting from the day-to-day -day management of those companies because I want to do, po I want to do podcasts all day. Um, uh, uh -huh. But yeah, I mean, it's uh, one of the things where a lot of us are stuck in the trap where we're too busy working in our business to actually work on our business. Absolutely. Yep. You know, totally so agree I, with you. That's... It's been, it's, it's been like a, probably yeah. a three year process of, um, you know, uh, delegating and trusting and finding the right people and you know allowing them to see profit and loss within their division right i mean that was a big step for me allowing uh -huh. the, an employee to see the, not the whole group not the whole group all three but just one part of it it's a big trust factor man because you think man if this kid sees how much money this this division makes why wouldn't he just go start his own right you know um you're, but, you're yeah. smarter than most of us to uh to diversify that that uh, um, strength for the company, you know, I wasn't that smart. No, I had to. Time. I had to build it. it, it Toronto's yeah. hyper competitive in the lighting market simply because mm -hmm. we um, we have a lot of Chinese immigrants from mainland China, and they're really smart and they're good business people, and they have access to LED products direct, so they don't have to buy right. through any of the you know um, importing brands. Um, you know, so, you know, so they, they're just going, so their pricing is way lower. And so it's a very, very competitive market. I had to do it. And if I didn't do it, I might not be doing this podcast right now. So as you know, as business owners, it's interesting how, um, the challenge of competition makes you smarter, makes you wiser, makes you make better decisions. It makes you expand your horizons as opposed to, you know, a lot of people that, you know, don't buy into the capitalist, um, 
idea. They think that competition is bad. It's actually good. It always helps to have competition. But Absolutely. as you said, the problem though is that there's so much, so there's a lot of uneducated people in the lighting business and the consumers are largely uneducated as you were saying. It's, it's a problem, man. It, it, it really is. And, and you're, you're, we're sitting there in the attraction to lighting. It, it, we're sitting here and I've heard this number from the DOE that it, the, 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 the dollars there's a $400 billion base of legacy technology out there right now that's ripe to be retrofitted. You turn that into LED and controls, it's a $600 billion market we're looking at. That's going to take years to convert that. You know, there are some people say, what's going to happen in 10 years when everything's been converted to LED and there's nothing else to do? I don't buy into that. Personally, I think it's, it's a 25, 30 year endeavor and we're going to continue going through the cycle of better efficiency LED product. I'm not afraid of that. Last year, the industry made 200 million T12 lamps still. So it's going to take a while, in my opinion, a while to convert everything over. But it's a huge market. It, and, 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 and then second to that, 75% of our opportunities out there are in the retrofit side versus new construction. And that's where folks like the nail folks have the advantage because we understand that retrofit business better than new construction. That's our primary business, sure. I think, unless it's yeah. changed. The new construction side, I'm not as interested. You know, we do it in our company here. I'm not involved with it, but it's the agents control that. And for the most part, and it's spec stuff. And it's the retrofit side, which is a bigger market. And that's the market that, you know, we, we want to own that, that I've always tried to, to, to manage and own because it's so huge. How do you feel that we can combat this, our biggest competitor and our customer base, not really knowing what the options are? I mean, we all face it and we talk about it, but how is it ever going to get solved? Is it just time? Is there any? Well, that's, <laughs> my answer was going to be, it might, it's going to be time and, and heartbreak because there's mm -hmm. going to be a lot of decisions made. And, and I think, you know, people are going to make a mistake and they're going to look themselves in a mirror and say, I, I bought into something that I shouldn't have early on and the product's going to fail. And, there's going to be nobody there to, 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 to fix it. They're going to have to replace it at a second cost, and that word's going to get out. And I think, and at, at the end of the day, that's what's one reason. The, the, the other way is, quite frankly, I don't know if you guys were at Light Fair this year, but um, at Light Fair, I, I didn't count specifically, but I, I thought about the vendors that were there last year and the vendors that were there this year. And there's a, there a lot of difference. And mm -hmm. so next year, it's going to be different again. And I'm thinking, part of the problem we're having today is similar than we had in the early 90s, which again, you guys were in high school. But in the early 90s, when electronic ballast came out, there was 100 electronic ballast manufacturers. Every mm -hmm. time they can carry, try to take advantage of that yeah, sure. with a T8 electronic ballast. Well, sure. we're down, you know, we came down to three or four or five. Same thing's going to happen to LED. Not quite three or four or five vendors, but we're going to siphon through. The industry is going to vet out and a lot of these players are not going to be around. They can't sustain the R&D that's going to require to stay in the game, number one, number two, handle the defectives and the warranty issues that are out there, and they're going to go away. And so I think that's some of that's going to take care of itself. You know, Randy Reed was talking about that. We went to Frankfurt and Light Fair um, this year, and we, had, we did a podcast with Randy, and he was talking about consolidation a lot. He was talking about, so you had said exploding, said 2014 or whatever when you sold Nova. I think we're looking at a little bit of contraction in the business. Um, I don't know where it's going to happen, but you know, I, I get uh, all the time. I'm getting, um, different, uh, emails from vendors, uh, with sales on previous generation five, generation six, extremely low prices uh -huh. on some of this stuff. I, you know, I, I think the, the increasing, um, uh, lumens per watt and improved quality along with the reduction in cost of the led products is taking its toll at the higher levels of the business. So say on the Sylvania, Phillips and GE side, the big guys are feeling it. And I think it's coming down to the, um, the, uh, set, you know, the second tier guys that are out there. They're feeling that crunch of a, of a, you know, you have to sell more and more and more to do the same amount of revenue. And that's a, that's like being um, a gerbil on a wheel a little bit. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. And everyone's diversifying, everyone's adding services, everyone's doing other things. But I think there's going to be a bit of a crunch. And, and one of the episodes we wanted to do was, uh, you know, what happens if there's no rebates? You know, what happens then? I mean, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, so I, I'm not sure 
I agree with you on. I agree with you that there's still 200 million T12s out there. I don't know where you got the number, but it sounds legit to me. I think it's regional, but I think also I think we're going to be in for a bit of a crunch in the next three to five years. Do you feel that, Bill? Are you being overly optimistic because you're on a podcast, or what is your your true thoughts on that? So I'm 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 uh, so you're you're saying there's going to be a, a crunch in terms of when you of, say consolidation. Um, the reason why sales. there's consolidation yeah. and you, the, one more comment on Frankfurt and, and then sure. I'll jump in. Frankfurt was a party, man. Everybody mm-hmm. was giving away free booze. Craig and I were going around, hey, free beer. There was at the end of the day, there was like a dance party in somebody's booth, and they had a DJ, and people were dancing and partying. It was crazy. Okay, Correct. ten buildings, you couldn't even see it all. Right. Light Fair was really subdued in comparison. Yeah. It, was. it was. It was subdued. There wasn't as much excitement. The, yeah. the, the, the exhibit hall wasn't full. Right. And I think i tell you why. I almost didn't go this year because I said, you know, the only difference in my opinion, I, it pretty much proved out. The only difference this year over last year in Light Fair was two things. One, the fixture was uh, going to look the same. The lumens per watt was the difference. And then everything was going to be IOT and controls. And that's exactly what it was. Um, it was all about controls and it was all about more efficiency in the fixture. And to your co- uh, comment on price points, I think price points have come down dramatically in the last three years. They have leveled off somewhat, in my opinion. They've leveled off. I mean, you're, you know, some of the prices are ridiculous. Tubes, how do you make money on that? But yes, eventually, um, that's why I'm saying some of these for lack of a better word, the tier three, four, five, six, seven players that are out there, they can't survive with those slim margins. They don't have the full breadth and depth that a, the larger tier one guys have, who there may still be consolidation in that area as well. I mean, one of those players may buy another, but you're seeing companies like um, that we've seen forever and nailed the Helcos and the Icos and the Satcos of the world. You know, I'm involved behind the scenes on, on some of this that they're, they're right for the picking because they see that curve going down for them. They've been on an upswing for a number of years. So it's a perfect time for them to Mm. show their books to a investor or another company. And they're being bought for that very reason. But unfortunately, some of these buyers, in my opinion, are going to be staring themselves and they're going to stare their numbers in the face a year from now. And it's going to be on a downward slope in my opinion. And I think some of the players, um, if you look at, if you look at the stock market, if you look at Acuity, Cree, uh, those players that are U.S.-based stock, all they're all the, they're all in the negative, and, and and it's and it's it's challenging from their perspective. And and one of the challenges we haven't even talked about, you may have talked about on a different podcast, is not price. That is a challenge, but it's inventory. And you mentioned Generation mm-hmm. One, Two, Three, Four, mm-hmm. Five. Inventory is a huge challenge, not only for the bath. vendors. It's a bloodbath. It, but but for us. Like, what do we stock? But because everything is, everything is a, is a project. It's yeah, either totally. new construction or it's a retrofit. So it's spec specific. Mm-hmm. So why do we stock? We're not to the point where we were at TH where we knew exactly how many fixtures, I mean, lamps we're gonna sell every day. Sure. So there's a lot of things going on that cause, it cause a lot of trauma in, in our world. Price is one, which is gonna eliminate, to Greg's point earlier, eliminate some of these players out there and they're not gonna be able to survive. And uh, some of those customers that bought early on are, are going to be bit. And I hate that. Hmm. So do you think I'm going back to when you got bought? I keep going back there, but I, I have a reason yep. for it. Is, uh, sure. do, you, do you feel like 2014 was the right time for you to sell? Or do you think you would have been better off holding? Do you look back now you know, and think differently? I, I, yeah. So I've been asked that question. I have never, I have not looked back. You know, when, when, I'm, when you make a decision like that, you can't. You know, when I yep. left Phillips Lighting as a regional manager and I moved into a – small three million dollar foreclosed company you know there's there's risk and you can't look back you got to be confident enough to move forward so at 214 one of the things i haven't mentioned is that the company that acquired us um i i asked look it can't be about me you have to offer every one of my employees a position and they did mm-hmm. so every one of my employees had a job so from that perspective timing was good and it's really worked for some of those guys bigger company bigger benefits we're esop you know BSC is, is a great company. So I, I haven't looked back. You know, I was 54, 55, been in the business at that point for 27 years, 28 years. So it's not too bad being a part of a big entity where you got a little more resources. Um, 
and a little more access to a certain size customer base. You know, I, I don't want to say I've been there, done that, but, you know, I played the game with Phillips for 15 years, had my own for 15, and, and now I'm here and hopefully, you know, got another 10 years in me. So I, I don't have any regrets to answer your question. Okay. And, and I say as, that looking you in the eye. Yeah, no, that's good. On a computer. <laughs> 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 what a world we live in, though, eh? Isn't it incredible it that is, we can do it this? It's awesome. I, I think what yeah. you guys are doing is phenomenal. I really do. Thanks. I think. Thank it's, you, man. It, and it, it's great to answer your question. This is a great yeah. avenue for education for these mm -hmm. customers that are out there that don't know the questions to ask and learn about the lighting industry, learn how to do it the right way. It's crazy um, so how many people actually listen. How many people listen to our podcast? Yeah. Matt. Matt was doing some research, Greg, and our yeah. podcast has been listened to in seventy-two different countries around the world. Wow. wow. That's impressive. Yeah, by th by thousands <laughs> nice. and thousands and thousands of people. It's it's really wild uh, how much it's blown up. So sorry to cool. interrupt you there, Greg, but I'm just going to brag no, a little good. bit. Thank you. Need to do that. Uh, now, as far as border states, how, how many is it a billion dollar company? Is that what you said? It's privately held, but it's it's but it's uh, it's OK. We're an ESOP, which is really good for the employees, yep. especially the younger ones. But it's it's a two billion dollar company. Ooh, so we're brilliant. we're seventh. With the seventh largest full line player in the world, in the country, um, yeah, America and, is the world to Americans. We understand that. Yeah. True, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and do, do you have an, a sense of what percent of your sales are lighting at border states? I, I I don't know exactly because there's so many different divisions and and uh, new construction retrofit. And it's really probably hard, it's hard to tie that down, but I I, I think it's a pretty reasonable percent. Um, 20 percent, I think, which is reasonable because we're heavily into the utility world mm. and, and construction. Um, excuse me, but um, lighting is an important part of the company, and we've made it more important to them. I mean, that's the talk of the town in the full line electrical business today, right? What's going on with switch gear? What's going on with commodities? It's nothing yeah. um, except for price deviation. The excitement in the R and D is is um, is lighting. You got a customer out there. You sell switch gear, oh, ho hum, I'm already buying it. Commodity is no big deal. Lighting, everybody wants to talk about lighting, right? Everybody wants to talk about LED and controls. You know, whether they buy or not, it's a different situation. But everybody wants to talk to the store. We can go in and, and sell nine or eight, eight or nine different benefits or value add services for that customer with lighting, you know, with a pipe wire or, or switch gear. You know, it's it's not it's not the same game. That's why I'll never move. I'll never move over. I won't be a trader that much. Where I'm going to move over to that uh, side of the fence. So nice. I'm still still tattooed lighting. There you go. Uh, I was going to ask you a little bit about controls there, Bill. Um, mm -hmm. I've said on this show many, many times, and uh, you know, I've had to actually believe it or not, I I do get like hate mail. <laughs> Call again. You don't know anything about controls. Um, I, can you, is there anything more you can offer a customer from an energy savings? Like I want to set aside whether or not addressability is actually something that can generate savings. Cause I don't know if that's true or not. So let's just, let's assume that, that, that there are some customers that addressability is excellent for and IOT is excellent for but for the vast majority, yeah. it's not. Can we, can we assume that for a minute that addressability would yes, largely be I useless? I use the word useless, right? Did I hear that? Yeah. Yeah. So I here's how I feel about controls. I, I think code is driving a lot of that. So if you're in California, you're either going to not pull a permit or you're going to pull a permit and you got to follow code. I believe controls in a lot of a lot of ways and the watt stoppers and Lutrons and the Levitons of the world are not, not going to like what I say, but I think controls can be oversold. I really do. So if you look at doing a retrofit and you're looking at an ROI, okay, your, your LED fixture is dropping your wattage down, in some cases, 70%. So you have that much wattage to control. Yeah, you've already saved all And you're spending that much money. Yeah. Exactly. So then you put all these controls in there. So if you did a separate ROI on, these are energy saving controls, not the data driven IoT stuff, which is a yeah. different situation, but your energy saving controls you do an ROI separately on that. So you, okay, you do an ROI on LED, spend, spend $100,000 in LED, save 70%, you get your payback in two years. Okay, we're gonna put these controls in there, which are gonna control what's left. Exactly. Okay, you're gonna spend 25,000, you're gonna save two. So it's a, it's a you know, 10, 12, 12, 13 year 
yeah, ROI. It's, it's not uh, as predictable either. You can't really predict yeah. what controls are going to do. You, you can know? estimate, and there's estimates out there from all these control companies all day long. And I think controls are good. But I was in a meeting yesterday, and they talked about you know color, all these exciting things: circadian rhythm, dimming, you know, daylight harvesting, which is cool. And so I've been out there for a long time. Color tuning, all great stuff. But there's a cost to it, and really, it's it's almost impossible to measure the financial benefits of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a feel good thing, and some companies are buying into that, which is fine. But I I'm I'm with you there. I'm as Greg I, you said earlier. I'm optimistic. Uh, and I am an optimist when it comes to controls and all, I think it, we're five years out. IoT is a five-year game. I think when you're looking at space utilization and data collection, the vendors want to want to own the data. But space utilization, yes, there's you can put a financial crunch to that, such as we're going to build a $50 million building because we run out of space. Well, my, my controls, my IoT told me that 25% of my space is not being used, so... I don't have to build a new building. Yeah, if you went that far, you can say, okay, I saved the company $50 million, but I don't think it's as easy as the as some control companies want to make out to believe in real life. Reduced wattage, okay, is very easy to calculate, okay? You reduce the Black wattage, and white, right? black yeah. and white, yep. You know, and, and we have a theme, or actually we've created a meme on this show called The Matrix, okay? And, and that matrix is like, about Li-Fi and IoT and the security, inter, um, the national security and privacy issues that could be entailed through um, the use of Li-Fi and the deployment of IoT and, and lighting devices. So we call it the matrix. We It's our most popular meme by far. It's our most popular uh, podcast. It's the one that uh, non-lighting people listen to and enjoy. Um, and we're actually looking to get a, a security advisor from Brookings Institute or something like that to come on the show and, and address this with us. But, you know, Greg, you got a brand new phone, right? An S8 or something like that? Yeah, 9, I think. Yeah, yeah S9 nine or whatever it is, right? I have Ooh, a BlackBerry. Got a nine. Ooh, I have a BlackBerry, buddy. Okay. <laughs> you don't have a flip phone. I thought you had a flip phone. I, I did Michael. have a flip phone for a while. I did. I did. I go back to flip. I still have it in my desk. Oh, great. I put my SIM card in and roll it for a bit because I, I like to disconnect. I need, right. to, I need room to think, man. So uh, there's, um, you know, the, the, but you, you take a look at this sort of thing and Greg's on his phone and we're trying to look at an email and this is a brand new phone and he pushes the email thing and it takes forever for that email to load. Right. And I'm thinking to myself as I, we we're in St. Louis and Greg was trying to call up this email and it took forever for it to come up and they went to another one it took forever to, for it to come up. And I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, a lot of that functionality that's in that phone is not to help the user. It's to spy on the user and send information back through apps and through things. That's why, oh, we need access to your some stupid app that, you know, uh, you're supposed to deliver food, you know, to you. It needs, info, it needs, uh, it needs to be able to go into your contacts. It needs access to your pictures and all this sort of stuff. And you have to give access to all this personal information that's in your phone to this application. You press yes, you click yes. Um, you know, uh, the whole argument for IoT is there's probably, and I'm going to say it again about the matrix, there's probably a better case for that technology to be used to spy on you so the people deploying it, using it to get information and using that information for nefarious purposes rather than actually providing data for people to use to help them and improve their business experiences or make their lives better or to help them save energy. The biggest argument for IOT is for someone to get into it and spy on someone. And well, yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with, no, no, I'm sorry, but I, the word that's in my head right now is an invasion of privacy. Sure. I'm, I'm in agreement with you there. And I think it, but it sounds so cool when on a pole light and where, where we're involved is lighting is the is the best place to collect data because fixtures are everywhere and pole lights are everywhere so you can put a camera on there you can put sensors on there we can get a count of people walking by you got bluetooth on your phone you walk into a store and bang you get hit with a coupon i mean all those things are cool right they're cool to talk well, with about bluetooth, but with bluetooth you have to choose right so you have right. your phone. Yeah, you can shut it off. Yes. Right? I can turn off my near yeah. field communication. I can turn off right. my Wi Fi. I can turn off my Bluetooth, whatever it is I want to do. But with Li Fi, 
Li-Fi can be programmed, and this is my opinion. Everyone says, call again, you're crazy. I bet you Li-Fi could be programmed that you don't have to choose, that it can just see you, recognize your gate, maybe recognize your face as you walk into the mall or wherever it's deployed. Maybe it's going to be deployed everywhere. And, you know, now you have no choice but to give up where your location is, what you're doing, who you are, why you're there, everything else. And I, I'm, it, may, it makes me very uncomfortable. That's why yeah. I call it the matrix. It's, it's something that is happening so quickly. And people talk about um, all sorts of security concerns with different manufacturers. And the lighting industry is not even addressed. And it's the most pervasive. Like, let me give you an example. I'll give you an example, okay? I am doing, uh, I'm quoting a project for an enormous US-based IT company. Enormous, okay? And it, um, it's about half a million bucks to a million bucks depending on what they choose okay and when those light bulbs go in there no one's going to check which light bulb in, is in the box exactly i could put whatever i wanted in there yep yep and i could have a a, a chinese state-owned company pay me on the back end to put different technology in there that could then spy on people you know i'm, I'm not kidding you imagine if you hey you wanted to spy on throw a name out there, Cisco, Hewlett Packard, IBM, Google, or whatever. If you were able to deploy it within the technology and it could listen, connect to the Wi-Fi, download things, whatever they wanted to do. And everyone always, security is only related to the sophistication of the person who wants to spy on you, right? That's all it is. It, if, you, if, they, if they feel like they want to spy on you, they'll spy on you no matter how good your security is. Right. Um, you only have to read the history of the Cold War to find out before we had all this stuff how sophisticated spying could get. And now that we have all this stuff, it must be unbelievable what the stuff's going to come out from, you know, in 25 years whenever they release the, what is that, 50-year release or whatever it is. So, I, you know, I mean, I'm talking about it on the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. I'm just a lighting salesman. I go crazy with this. Greg always gets mad at me. Not so much Matrix <laughs> talk, but I mean – you know, I just no, you're, see you're exactly right. No, you're right because it's. I, I never thought about it until you said that. I, I've had meetings with some of the largest bank in the United States, and we're talking about IoT uh, strategy. And, and 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 half the conversations today are with the IT folks. Where you know, before we grew up talking to the maintenance guys and the engineer guys, now we're talking to the IT guys because it's all about security. Well, their security f a focus is on the control device, but the point you just made. Is they're not even thinking about the fixture you're putting in. I could put a fixture in the ceiling above the president's desk. Yeah, sure. Yeah, the LED, it's got a little camera in it. They'll never know it. Or it's got some kind of, um, you know. Microphone. Microphone. And yeah. nobody thinks about that. They yeah, all focus that, on the And hang control. on, only like that though. You could, you could do the whole office and it has its own independent Bluetooth mesh, which is on some other radio signal. Yeah. Or uses Li-Fi to bounce it off and all that sort of stuff. And then a guy stands outside with some, parks his car in the parking lot and connects into it and gets all the information. I mean, yeah, there's, right. I, I mean, I, the way I think about it is like that is such an obvious way to spy on someone. I have done so many projects in places you have to sign security things up the wazoo. German, for, German companies that have factories in Canada and they have all this security stuff. Who are you? What's your license? All sort of stuff, and then I go put whatever lighting I want in there. And they, they, they don't they don't look at your fixture. They don't. Yeah, it's it's amazing. When, yeah, if you think about it, that it's deeply, a double yeah. it's a double sensor fixture. What do you mean double right. sensor? Well, it's got two sensors in case one breaks. No, right. the other one's a camera. The other one's a microphone. Right. I mean, who knows, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. It's it's it can be scary, and I think it's it, it's an invasion of of privacy. Um, but people are not talking about it as much as you are. And I, and I think that's, 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 I think it's a good thing the way you're thinking, because it's, it's fact, it's real. And I think a lot of people, much like what they did or in the early adopters of LED, they didn't think through it. They were misinformed. The same thing's going to happen to IOT. They're going to buy this quote bill of goods at this point and not know, you know, not only will the ROI not be there, but what data they're going to be capturing, they're exposing themselves to stuff. They, they may not would have exposed themselves to if they knew the facts. So that, that speak, is a concern. Let's, let's speak in realistic terms, and then I'll, and Greg's going to give me a look and say, okay, back to light bulbs. But I think we are on light bulbs in a sense. Let me we ask are. you a question, Bill, and then, then you'll know where I'm going with this. Um, in terms of the geopolitical world we live in, what's America's number one enemy? Canada. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We've always been that. Yes. You got it right. No, but it's China. It's China, right? It's, yeah, Absolutely. Right, because of technology, own, yeah, 
Right. It's it's China. So there's a technological war going on between the United yeah. States. There mm -hmm. is a cyber war going on right now between the uh, U.S. and China, for sure. China is known to have spied on American companies, no, no doubt. And they're making all this technology. Right. Yeah. Well, who's to say what they're going to what device they put in that technology? They're not your friends, man. It's right. not like buying I something agree. from the Canada or even Mexico or Germany or whatever. They're not a friend to they're not a friend to the United States. And well, um, something's got to happen there because they they're controlling. You know, I don't know if you've ever done a government project where they mandate U.S. made. I don't know what they do in Canada, but you really can't do that today. I and mean, you really couldn't done it with a T8 because they electronic ballast. But what percent of your LED tubes are made overseas? All of them. Hundred percent. Yeah, drivers yeah. the same way. I mean, the the the, the, so the the and the chips, most of the chips are not made here. So, all your components which drive data and drive technology are not made in the United States. So there's a lot of things that can happen with that. And lighting is also a militarily strategic technology, and a lot a lot of people don't uh, really see it that way. But it's the old adage: like if you if you can't make your own clothes, what are you going to wear when you go to war, right? <laughs> So if you if America went to war with China, hopefully God, you know that would be absolutely insane. But let's say that happened, or let's say some sort of serious tensions began to arise. Where are you gonna get your light bulbs, son? All right. How are you yep. gonna light you your what buildings? Remember what happened? What happened a few years ago with the triphosphor? Yeah, sure. They just put the squeeze on them, man. Right. And you know they, what? They owned, they owned it. Doctor Venkat Venkataranmanan. Did I get it right, Greg? He was on our uh, podcast. Close. The close. He's uh, he says that uh, lighting is the greatest productivity invention of human in human history. Artificial lighting is the greatest driver of productivity of all inventions in human history. Over the wheel, um, and the only greater one is modern plumbing. So you know, a toilet being number one, oh. and then artificial lighting being number two overall. So if you if we lose the ability to do that, so that's a deep rabbit hole we just went into there, but. It's been a theme on this show, and, I, and I've been saying it forever, and it just occurred to me because I'm in all these buildings doing projects, and I'm like, man, if someone wanted to spy on these guys, bro, I know how to do it. So, and I, maybe I'm a devious I, I, thinker. I don't know. Yeah. No, I, I, I just, I think you're a real thinker. I think you're thinking through things. You don't accept things at face value, which is what we need today. Okay, Michael, no. President of the United States, right now. <laughs> I'm coming for you, Trump. <laughs> Now, to tie into a little bit of this conversation are these tariffs. So I got an email today from Sylvania. Bill, I don't know if you did too, but it, it said, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. But therefore, if tariffs go into effect, there will be a corresponding cost price increase on many products you purchase from Leadvance as early as September 1. So that's the first letter I've seen on it where it actually talks about there's going to be a price increase potential. What is your thought on that? Well, Right after Light Fair, if you guys, I don't know if you have a relationship with Acuity, but Acuity sent out a letter, and so the other fixture guys, they had a they had an increase on a, a good part of their product portfolio, um, and and it may come back to you know what you said earlier, Michael, that you know the price deterioration and nobody's making money, and the stock prices are impacted, and the only way to make money, if you think about um, a, a, the, a large price of a fixture five years ago was the diode. They've come down like 90%. And so there's not a whole lot of money being made on, on, on that anymore. And then they're sitting on this old generation. But I haven't seen that letter from Sylvania. I'm not surprised. I think prices have gone down five straight years. I think it is for LED. And I think there had to be a bottom. And I'm not saying it's the bottom today, but you're probably going to see more of that. And I think, quite frankly, I don't want to be pessimistic about this, but you know, they may, the industry may be able to take advantage of the perceived tariff to get a price increase out of the market. Do you know the history of income tax and tariffs in the United States? That's Are really they hand interesting. In hand? Yeah. No. So what happened was before, I don't know what it was. It was 1914 or something like that. So America used to never have income tax. They had tariffs. Okay. So they, the federal government of the United States raised money by, with tariffs. And then they, they switched to income tax and they ended all tariffs, right? And what people don't understand is that tariffs don't are, are what, what that means is now you're going to be play, paying income tax, but you're not going to have the benefit of cheap products from abroad, which was the purpose. So they eliminated the tariffs 
and they made stuff cheap for everybody, and they put in a, uh, a punitive income tax, which taxes the rich more than the poor. So that's how that was the deal struck between the American people and its government, saying, okay, if you put in an income tax, you have to get rid of the tariffs, and they got rid of the tariffs. And now tariffs are just going to drive an increase in consumer products for Americans, and it's, it's not a win for Americans, especially when you tariff products from Canada. Come on, man. Don't be tariffing yeah, our, us. Our, our friends up in Canada, yeah. No, but uh, you I know, mean, I, tariffs don't help people. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, you know, we can get into this political discussion oh, yeah, yeah, for about, sure, uh, but, but, <laughs> but I won't. But I'm not anti you know, any, I, I any, time, any no, American no, 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 political no. party or anything time, like that. So time, time will tell in reality the impact on. I think we're t it's too soon. I think there's mm. a there's a battle back and forth. It's political. It's too Do you think too it's heavy. A bluff? I, well, I, you know, he's great at that. The, the current mm -hmm. president of the United States is is uh, likes to strong arm and maybe call a bluff and hoping that the other guy will back down. Mm. So it, 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 whether that's true or not, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm one who will, I'm going to sit back and not, not much I can do. Right. And uh, prepare myself from an inventory perspective and perhaps a little bit, but I don't know how the extent of the tariffs, I don't know the, any impact, but I do think some vendors will take advantage of the perceived uh, price increase that's coming and may, which, you know, it, it it's not a bad bad thing. It, it'll it'll impact ROI, but you know, at the end of the day, if we are on our side of the fence, it your sales margin dollars will go up. You know, the percents may or may not be impacted. But if that's the market, the competition, all the competitors are doing it. That's that's great. Uh, what 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 the negative is? Your tier one guys are going to go up, and then the lower tier guys are are not going to go up, and that's going to kind of add to the the challenge. That's exactly what my point was. Has, has there ever been a time, or what it was going to be, has there ever been a time where Tier 2 has come to you and said, I'm going to increase my price? No uh, chance, never son. <laughs> so I'll go to the other Tier 2. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> No chance. So it's, it's our, our, our business in the last five years, from <laughs> technology to, to pricing to the number of competitors we have out there, is just, it's, it's a nightmare to manage. Mm -hmm. But I, I do believe this. And this is where my optimism comes into play, that if you do things the right way as, as a distributor or a vendor and you sell the right product and you sell what's best for the client, make money where you need to make money at fair rate um, and you support that and back it up and you're here for five years to support that warranty, then I think in the long run, you may lose an order here and there. And I'm willing to walk away from 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 a, an order if it's the requirement of me of selling a, a junk product. I'll walk away all day long. And I'll just tell the customer that you'll probably see me in a couple of years. But I think if you do things the right way, I think we, in which I know you guys do, and we try, that we'll beat we'll beat this mess. Um, no doubt about it. It's a matter of time. I think that's good. a good spot to close on. Absolutely. Thank you for coming on the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast, Bill. Hey, man, this has been awesome. Great to see yeah. you guys. Yeah, good to see you again, you. Bill. Thanks, Bill. All right, see you, man. Woo! Keystone Technologies. Go to K E Y S T O N E T E C H dot com, baby. That's KeystoneTech.com. Why are we going to go to Keystone, Greg? Are we going to look at some high bays from them or what? Yeah, they've got that new high bay fixture that is a real nice option to use. Uh, they have accessories that you could imagine too 0 to 10 volt dimming, 480 volt. They even are compatible with their emergency LED drivers that they have. That's a nice system. Uh, frosted lens comes automatically with it, zero to 10 volt dimming and good lumens per watt, good life, everything you'd expect out of Keystone now in a fixture. Yeah. And if anything goes wrong, you know where to find that driver. Keystone's got them. So great warranty, great product, great, great people, light made easy. And this podcast and every podcast on the get a grip .com, get a grip on lighting .com website is sponsored by the national association of innovative lighting distributors. And you just heard from one of their former presidents, Bill Hurd. He was a legend. He was a legend back in the day, and he still is. And we were happy to have him on the show and, and discuss all the different issues that we usually discuss on the show. It was That's what it's like to come to a convention, son. Come on, and daughter, or whatever you say to a girl. Come on down to to the Nailed Convention and hang out with us. Uh, go to NALD.org uh, for information on joining, taking LS1, LS2. And thank you for listening. Episode 39 on the Get a Grip on Lenny podcast. <laughs>
Sitting on the rectory wall There's a sign there for all 